Hey there, welcome back to our Sky Tonight program. This is Seth Mayo, Curator of Astronomy for the Loman Planetarium at MOAS. And in this edition, we're covering the dates of November 7th through November 13th. We're going to start by talking about that really great opportunity to see the total lunar eclipse at the beginning of the week. We'll discuss that opportunity and the details around it. Then we're going to mention the opposition of Uranus when it's closest to Earth in its orbit. And we'll end with a look at an interesting meteor shower opportunity with the northern Taurids occurring this weekend. So let's get to it. As we make our way into the morning of Tuesday, November 8th, we have a full moon. And the full moon in November is typically called the beaver moon or the frost moon. I love the name beaver moon. In certain parts of the world where there are beavers, this is the time of year when beavers are starting to enter into their lodges and getting ready for winter time. That name is near and dear to me because I grew up in a town called Beaverton. Oregon when I was younger. The other name being a frost moon makes sense at this time of year as we're approaching the winter time. It's getting colder in some parts of the world. We're starting to see frost already begin. So this is a time of year as we transition into a colder season. And the exact time of this full moon is at 1102 Universal Time for us in the East Coast. That is 602 in the morning. Now keep in mind, just the previous Sunday, November 6, we had daylight saving time end. And that means for those who participate in these changes, we fell back an hour. So now our times related to Universal Time have changed because of that switch. But what also is exciting about this full moon is that the moon, the earth, and the sun will be lining up in a straight line, a syzygy, and that creates what's called a lunar eclipse. And for this event, this is a total lunar eclipse when the moon completely passes into Earth's shadow, and it turns the moon a bloody red color. That's why I hear it called the blood moon. And if you recall, earlier this year, we had a lunar eclipse that was in the middle of May, and I took this picture through one of our museum telescopes getting just a really great view of that reddish color, all of Earth's sunrises and sunsets being projected onto the moon, which creates that ruddy red color, making the moon really dim, but really interesting looking around the time of the eclipse. So we have another opportunity. And for us here in the East Coast of the United States, this is actually in the morning. And that's for most places in the US. This is a early morning event when the moon is actually starting to set in the Western part of the horizon. So I'm gonna speak for the East Coast, but if you're in other time zones, other locations, just keep in mind this will be a little bit different. Just pay attention to the universal time for the different eclipse contact points that I'll discuss here. And here in Stellarium, we can watch this event play out as we're looking to the west in the early morning. The first moment you're gonna see any real change is about 9.09 .09 universal time or 4.09 Eastern Standard Time. So let's continue on here. And as we do so, we're gonna see that moon start to dip into Earth's shadow by that time you can see the top side of the moon starting to fall right into it as the earth is rotating and bringing the moon farther to the western horizon as we make our way through you're going to see the moon getting dimmer and darker here we'll continue speeding up time here and we'll go a little faster as we move to the total lunar eclipse that really begins fully by about 10 16 universal time or 516 Eastern Standard Time. And that is when the moon is really immersed in Earth's shadow, turning that reddish color. And what's really great about this is you're gonna see more stars and objects around the moon again, because the light pollution from the moon will be diminished by this point. The moon is a lot dimmer during a lunar eclipse. As we continue on here, you can see for us in the eastern side of the United States, the moon is quite low and near the horizon. So for us, we don't actually get to see the entirety of this lunar eclipse, but we get some of the best parts of it. As we continue on here, maximum eclipse when the moon is fully into Earth's shadow, right in the middle of it, at least as most the middle as it can get, that's about 6 a.m. Eastern time, or really 11 a.m a.m. universal time, as we see about here. And for us, you'll see how low the moon is in the horizon. So we don't have much more time to see it right after maximum eclipse, but again, we still have a good amount of time with the eclipse here. We'll continue on, and then eventually the moon will set when the sun rises in the opposite side of our sky and beginning the new day. Sunrise is 641 local time. So you'll have to adjust for your time zone, but this is mostly a morning event that is occurring. You'll have a chance to see it. So if you're getting up before work or school or whatever you may be doing, 
Hopefully you get a chance to take a look at this. And this is also happening on election day as well. So a lot of interesting things going on here, at least in the United States. I also want to bring up NASA's eclipse chart here to help us understand what's going on. This provides the times, the location where you can see this, and even the shadow of Earth and how the moon is passing through it. And that is what you see actually here in the middle. And these are what are called contact points when the moon first enters into Earth's shadow or called the umbra, that's the darkest part of the shadow, and then fully immersed in that shadow, then maximum eclipse. And then when it begins to end here, at least the total eclipse ends, and then the moon continues its path away from Earth's shadow there. So it gets pretty immersed into the shadow, which again is red because of our atmosphere being projected on the moon. The sunlight is refracted through our atmosphere onto the moon itself. Down at the bottom here, it gives you a map of where you can see this eclipse. So if you're in Europe or Africa, sadly you can't see it in those parts of the world. But in many other places we can, depending on where you are. So here in the Americas, we can see the eclipse during moonset when the moon is getting low in the west. If you're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean or maybe Hawaii, you get to see the entire eclipse from beginning to end. And then if you're in areas of Asia or Oceania, Australia, you get to see the eclipse at moonrise. The moon is rising and that's occurring, but you miss out on some of the eclipse as it's rising out of the eastern part of the sky. So the nice thing about lunar eclipses is that they can be seen in many parts of the world. It just depends really on your longitude. And these times here are those eclipse contacts I mentioned here. So the ones to really pay attention to are U1, when it begins at 909 Universal Time. U2 is when the moon is first fully immersed in the shadow at 1016 UT. In between U2 and U3, that's at greatest eclipse or maximum eclipse. Over here it says 1059, pretty much 11 o'clock UT. And then at U3 is when the moon starts to leave Earth's shadow at 1141 Universal Time. U4 is when it's completely left Earth's umbra. So take a look at this chart and related to your location on Earth, so hopefully you'll get a good sighting of the last total lunar eclipse of 2022. Now occurring the morning after on Wednesday, November 9th, we have the opposition of Uranus when Uranus is opposite of the sun in our sky, but also when it's closest to us in its orbit. And Uranus on this morning is actually not too far from the moon that just went through that lunar eclipse. So we're gonna actually find that here in Stellarium, locate Uranus in the sky, something you can't really see with your naked eyes, but if you have a telescope, you might be able to notice it. And it will be a little bit bigger and larger through a telescope since it's closer to us. Now, when I say closer to us, it is still really far away. Remember, Uranus is the seventh planet from the sun in our solar system. And even at opposition, it's still about 1.74 billion miles away. That's 2.8 billion kilometers. Or another way to put it, it's 155 light minutes away. So about two and a half hours of light travel time right now between Uranus and us. So that is very far for us in terms of what we're used to, but for Uranus, that is a little closer in. And since that's the case, again, through a telescope, you might see a little more of the planet. And usually through a telescope, it looks like just this little orb or kind of bluish star. So you don't get much more beyond that. But of course, we can zoom into it more here in Stellarium and give us an even better view of the Uranus system. I always love talking about this planet. I don't think it gets enough attention. And Uranus is the third largest planet by diameter in the solar system, but it's the fourth largest by mass. Neptune is smaller in diameter, but more of a massive planet than Uranus. And it's always fun to know that Uranus was really the first planet to be discovered in a more modern time. Discovered by William Herschel, that English and German astronomer, who in 1781 saw Uranus in his telescope. So it became the first planet discovered outside of antiquity. The first one that you couldn't see with your naked eyes. And this is a large gas planet with a lot of ices. It has a lot of ammonia, water, and methane. And that's what's turned this planet kind of this bluish color to it. A planet that is also weird because it's tilted on its side. Its rings kind of go up and down and has 27 known moons. And this system being so far away from the sun takes a whopping 84 years to make one revolution. So that's one Uranian year time period. So quite a year for this planet. So maybe if you have a telescope and know how to locate Uranus in the sky, maybe an auto-guided telescope, or you can find the coordinates for the planet itself, 
you might be able to find it in the sky. This is actually in the morning when it's closest to us, but the moon being so close might make it harder to see. So if you wait some evenings or mornings after this when the moon's a little farther away, it's still fairly close to us in its orbit. It won't change dramatically so by then. So here's to Uranus getting closer to us, the seventh planet from our sun in the solar system. As we continue to look in the early morning sky and kind of in the same area because we just looked at Uranus right around here. And just so you know, this is Taurus the bull in the sky. Taurus is that mighty bull that is actually situated near Orion the hunter, a famous winter grouping of stars there. And of course, along the back of Taurus is the famous Pleiades star cluster. But there's something interesting going on inside this constellation, or at least radiating from this constellation, and that is a meteor shower called the Northern Torrids. This is not the most active and high producing meteor shower that occurs throughout the year, but I wanted to mention it because there's something interesting going on with it this year in 2022. And the peak of the Northern Torrids is on Saturday, November 12th. Let's turn on our meteor shower kind of radiant point locators here. And here is the radiant point actually right there along the back of Taurus and very near the star cluster of Pleiades that we find right there. The northern Taurids possibly come from an object related to a comet known as Enki. Enki is a pretty well-known short period comet that only takes about 3.3 years to go around the sun one time. And this comet may be one piece that came from a larger complex that broke apart years ago that had scattered other pieces of cometary debris and even asteroids around the sun. And these multiple objects, part of what's called the Enki complex, may produce multiple meteor showers. Not only the northern torrids that radiate here, but also the southern torrids that occurred recently. These two meteor showers are actually related and they may come from similar objects and they actually coincide. So the peak of the southern torrids was recent, either earlier this month or in October. It's kind of unclear the actual peak of this meteor shower, but it's still going on now while the northern towards are going on. So there's a confluence of multiple meteor showers kind of happening at once. And even though both these meteor showers only give you about five meters per hour, that's not a lot, occasionally we get more fireballs from these meteor showers every about seven years. So the last time this happened was in 2015, and seven years later here in 2022, there possibly will be a little more fireball activity. Those are larger meteors that really shine and streak across the sky. They actually kind of look like fireballs. And so there might be an opportunity to see a few more of these around the peak. Again, this may be Saturday morning or maybe Saturday evening, but usually the mornings are best for most meteor showers as we're headed directly into the stream or the path of these objects kind of moving through our solar system. So if you get up early in the morning, you might see it. The moon is kind of large and nearby. So that does make it a little more challenging with the light pollution, but fireballs can sometimes be seen even with some light pollution in the sky. So take advantage of that with these meters, again, that can streak anywhere in the sky, but if you trace them back, their origin point will be somewhere here in Taurus, hence the name, the Taurids, as we see here. So hopefully you can see some meteors coming up here over the weekend, maybe a fireball or two, as we watch some of this debris enter Earth's atmosphere. Hey, you made it through another episode of our Sky Tonight program. Thank you very much for tuning in. And if you happen to find yourself in Daytona Beach, please stop by the Museum of Arts and Sciences. We have a lot going on here. So if you want any more information about what we're doing, please check out our website and tune into our various social media channels. We're posting some great content from around the museum. I'll have to say happy lunar eclipse viewing and of course, happy stargazing. <laughs>